Well, good morning. My name is Bill Wynn. If you are joining us for the first time uh, on Facebook Live, or maybe you're watching it sometime um, during the week, <clears throat> welcome to all of those uh, of you who are here in person, and we're glad to, to have you here face to face. Um, we are Grace Communion Hanover, and we meet at 7300 Hanover Green Drive in Old Town Mechanicsville. So if you're in the area, stop in. We'd love to meet you. And uh, we're going to begin with a prayer today, as we do. Uh, so if you would, join me. Father in heaven, yours is a kingdom of power and authority on the earth. Uh, we do not worship a God of a distant kingdom. We worship the God who is king of this kingdom on earth. We recognize you, Father, as the giver of all good things. And we recognize, Holy Spirit, that you are the one who guides us into all truth. And that truth is Jesus. So we ask this now in his name. Amen. So today we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Um, I like it. Speaking of, you know, different translations, there's a bunch out there. Um, I think that what you might say about almost every translation is they're really good where they're good and they're bad where they're bad. And uh, Bible translations <coughs> are, um, well, first of all, you have to understand that the Bible was inspired by God, but it was written by human beings, right? So as, as soon as an imperfect influence is on anything that is originally perfect, it's going to be a little bit imperfect. There's going to be things that um, may or may not be exactly right. Uh, in, the, in the Gospels, for instance, there are uh, accounts that different disciples who were there, they say, well, there were 70. And then another disciple says, I don't know, I counted 72. So is that a, that's not a big deal to me. Uh, and it shouldn't, I don't think it should be a big deal to us. Uh, there are some books in the Bible, we don't know who wrote them, but they're in there. The book of Hebrews, for one. Um, there's, um, there's controversy in some circles over the, the, the pastoral letters to Timothy, whether or not they're authentic. I don't know. They're in there, and what I believe is when the Bible was canonized, that was done by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And there are several reasons why. I believe that, um, but in any case, um, we don't have the original. We have translations from a dead language that are not even translations from the original. We have translations from fragments. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls helped a lot when they were found because they were older, and so that's that's what. That's the job, that's really the responsibility of translators is to use the oldest, most reliable manuscripts that are available. And so I, I say all that to say this. Whatever translation you're using, remember the early church for the first 450 years, do you know what their translation was? Their translation was, we ain't got one. There was no New Testament Bible for the first 450 years. Now, coincidentally, maybe not, do you know what the period of time where the church grew the most was? It was the first few years. So, so which translation should we use, Pastor? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What you should know is the gospel. The go knowing the gospel will help you pick your translation. The early church didn't have a New Testament, but they knew who Jesus was. So if you'd have come along and you'd have had a gospel that said Jesus was really not God, he was just a good prophet, and somebody came along and said, hey, here's this letter that the disciple Thomas wrote, and you read it, and you go, wait a minute, he, Jesus is not God? 
You, you, mean, you mean the guy that put his hand in the, in the wounds of Jesus and saw him walk through the wall in the upper room. He said, Jesus is not God. I don't think this is authentic. I don't think this one's authentic. You see, the early church knew who is Jesus. That was their question. Who is Jesus? We're going to read um, in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 21, there's a word here that makes an impact when you think about it. I, at least it, it did for me. So this is uh, at the time, um, and Mark's gospel is, um, you know, I don't know if Mark had ADD or, um, uh, or if the brother was just in a hurry. His gospel is fairly short. It gets right to the point. I mean, you go read Matthew. I mean, how much is there before Jesus actually starts doing ministry? You know, there's all the all this narrative, and Luke has a lot of narrative, and and John gives you uh, Gospel of John, uh, my favorite. You know, but he gives you this this theological introduction, and all. Mark gets right to the point. Chapter one, he starts by saying, "Hey." <clears throat> um, Prophet Isaiah says, I'm sending a messenger. This is who he is. And um, by verse 9, we're talking about the baptism of Jesus. Right? And um, by verse 16 of the same chapter, we're already calling disciples. I mean, Mark is on a roll, man. He's ready to go. And, and part of what makes me believe that maybe Mark is John Mark from Acts that was Peter's interpreter and apprentice is because Peter, this, this sounds like Peter to me. Peter's like, come on, let's get on with it. Hey, you want us to build some altars? We'll build some altars. You want us to cut somebody's ear off? We'll cut somebody's ear off. What, you, you want us to call down fire from heaven? We'll call down fire from heaven. I mean, Peter is that guy that is ready, fire, aim. Right? He's already shot the gun before he ever even thinks about aiming. Uh, his mouth is in gear before his brain, right? So, so here we, we're reading Mark. And when we get to chapter 21, Jesus is already out teaching and healing. By chapter tw- uh, by, by verse 21 of, of chapter 1, Mark's already got us hearing about Jesus teaching and healing. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he, meaning Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. They were astounded. For the Jews of Jesus' day, and the same, it's the same for us. When someone is telling you something, you immediately want to know, how do you know that? That's how we would say it, right? How do you know that? Another way to say it is, by what authority do you say these things? By, by whose authority? Or, or by what source? Do you make these claims? So that's that's kind of the question that we all have. And the people in the synagogue that day had the same questions about who is this guy? Wait, what? Jesus went in there teaching, <clears throat> and he's uh, didesco, right? He's he's in there teaching, he's instructing, and when this 
when this unclean spirit confronts him, what does the un unclean spirit say? If the unclean spirit, I mean, I would have expected the unclean spirit to say, don't anybody listen to him, he's a fraud. Why would the unclean spirit say, I know who you are, you're the Holy One of God. I have a theory. Just my theory. I don't think those unclean spirits can stand in the presence of the living God and deny who he is. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You may not agree with Jesus in the by and by, but every body will... I'm not saying that everybody is going to say yes to Jesus, but I'm saying that everybody is going to know definitively that that is the Son of God. That is who Jesus is. This unclean spirit was not compliant with Jesus, um, except in the sense that he came out when Jesus commanded him to. He wasn't... He wasn't um, he wasn't surrendering his will to Jesus. Oh, yes, Jesus, I'll be your servant. I repent and I'll I'll follow you. No, the unclean, but the unclean spirit had to obey the authority of the creator of the cosmos. Well, so my, my grandpa used to say, You can show me better than you can tell me. When we were when we were growing up, all the grandkids, you know, my there was a, a place. Out back of the house, by the, there used to be a, a mule barn. By the time I came along, the mules were just, you know, out the pasture, and it was a tractor shed at that point. But um, in fact, I think not long after I was born, the mule died, the last one. So it was just a tractor shed, and there was a sycamore tree there, and Granddaddy would sit under the sycamore tree in this old aluminum folding chair. You remember those? Had the little woven, it would dry rot, and eventually one day you'd sit in it and go through. Um, and he, he had he had two two or three chairs out there, and some of his buddies would, would Jones Weldon would come and sit, and they'd, they'd sit out there, and they'd chew tobacco and smoke cigarettes and cigars and, and just shoot the breeze and talk about the good old days and lie. Um, it was a game they played. They call it. They called it tall tales, and they would they would make up tall tales, and then they would try to outdo one another. And uh, it was just great fun when I was a little boy. To, I'd sit out there, and there was an old wheelbarrow. I'd push that old wheelbarrow out there, and I could recline in it, you know. And I just lay in the wheelbarrow and listen to my my grandpa and his buddies just sit there and tell stories and and make up tall tales. I remember one in particular, um, Martin. I forget his last name, but he, he said that his daddy had a cow that was so big, it was a bull, sorry, had a bull so big that when he stood up all the way, his horns would stick in the moon. And my granddaddy said, shoot, my grandpa had a frying pan, took three of them. And that was the game they would play to try to outdo one another. Well, my grandpa, when we would, as grandchildren, we'd try to join in, you know, and we'd, we'd be talking about what we were going to do, what our big plans for life were, and we were going to do this, we were going to do that. And he would always say, you can show me better than you can tell me. So Jesus is in the synagogue teaching. And he's confronted by this unclean spirit. So why did Jesus command this spirit to come out of the man at that moment? Well, you'd say, well, there's a practical application here. He's being disruptive. and So Jesus deals with this problem so he can get back to his teaching. Well, there's also something else going on. Because the moment he casts away this unclean spirit, everybody recognizes that this man has authority. That even the unclean spirits have to obey him. Like the disciples in the boat. Jesus wakes up. They're all freaking out because of the storm. He rebukes the storm so he can go back to sleep. The storm didn't bother Jesus. But all their panicking must have. You know, they woke him up and said, Lord, do you not even care that we're about to drown? And what did the disciples say? Do you remember? They said, who is this man that even the wind and the waves 
Basically, David. That's authority. That's kingdom authority, if we want to give it a name. So, in verse 22, it says, they were astounded at his teaching. The word there is ekpleso, E-K-P-L-E-S-S-O, and it literally means to be moved out of your mind, shocked out of your mind, completely astounded. Your mind is blown, is how we would say it today. He blew their mind. Because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes would go into the synagogue and read from the law, the prophets, or the writers. That was their job. And they read, they, they, they read and interpreted in a grammatical way. This is this is what the this is what the words say. But there was no life in it. There was no authority in it. Jesus came along and his teaching was completely different. Jesus' authority supersedes the law. It supersedes the prophets and the writing. And what's amazing, it should be, to us, is that they were astounded at his teaching before they even had a hint of his authority. Because they were already astounded by his teaching. Then he cast away the demon, the unclean spirit, and they go, wow. This is amazing. And they, the room was abuzz, it says. They kept on asking one another. What is this? A new teaching with authority. A new teaching with authority. So whatever Jesus was teaching them, they had never heard before. And these were not Romans. These were not Syrians. These were not Egyptians. These were good, God-fearing Jews that were in the synagogue every Sabbath to hear the scribes expound the law. See, the law was given to humanity because humanity demanded law. Humanity rejected relationship and then subsequently demanded law. Don't give me this relationship business. Give me some rules to follow. I'm good with that. I can do the rules. Don't ask me to love people. Don't ask me to be kind to people. Don't ask me to esteem others higher than myself. That's too difficult. That's messy. Give me some rules. That's what Israel wanted. That's what ancient Israel wanted. They wanted rules. And so don't ever think that the law was given to mankind because God wanted mankind to follow a bunch of law. The law was given to mankind because mankind said, we want some laws. And you know what God said? Here, try this on. See how that works out for you. We'll give you some time. You say, well, golly. I mean, by the, from the time, the, I mean, we're talking a long time, right? Thousands of years? Well, I mean, it's only a few days to God. Right? You say, you left us in law and all this for about, no, it's just a few days. Just a few days. Tell you what, day after tomorrow, we'll get this all figured out. You think about it on God's timeline, it's really what? Astounding? Does that blow your mind? It blows mine. And then all at once, verse 28, his fame began to spread in the region around Galilee. Well, I guess so. I guess so, and of course we know uh, from the gospel account of all the different things that Jesus did that blew people's minds. And it upset the religious system. It upset the apple cart, as it were, to the point where they, they wanted to kill him and eventually did. I wanted to look for just a minute um, as a as a 
as a way of introducing uh, this final concept that I'd, I'd like to go over. Um, G, the, the language here is pretty clear. Uh, he tells the un, unclean spirit, he says, be silent and come out of him. So I know sometimes we talk about an unclean spirit or a fallen creature or you can say demon um, possessing a person. When, when we look at this account, we're looking at something that occurred before the cross. In the cross of Jesus, on his, in his act on Calvary, he draws all humanity into himself. He says, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all mankind into myself. And the reason for that is so we can die. Right? We never, this is a, a quote from Jeff McSwain. Um, he says, we never think, Dr. Jeff McSwain, sorry. We never think properly of the cross in terms of Jesus dying so that we don't die. We think properly of the cross when we think in terms of Jesus dying so that we do die. Jesus took humanity into himself and took us down in his death, out in his resurrection, and up in his ascension, and into his glorious kingdom life. So, what I would say post-cross, on the other side of the cross, is that demon possession maybe looks a little different. Much like, and I'll use this water, I am in possession of this bottle of water, right? I can manipulate it. I can control it. I can have influence over this bottle to a degree, but I'm not inside it. So I want you to understand that we don't fear, you know. I've heard people say, "Well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, don't want to talk to that person because they might have a demon in them, and I don't want it to get in me, or I don't want to watch. You don't want to watch a, a show like that because it did. Well, if you're worried about that, that probably should tell you enough. You probably shouldn't be watching that garbage in the first place. But demons aren't going to come live inside of you because of it, because Jesus lives inside of you. Jesus." is the indwelling Christ. And then I want to ask you a follow-up question. If that's true, how much room is in your neighborhood? Do you see Jesus walking down a dusty street inside your soul, looking at some demon and going, there ain't room in this town for the two of us? Well, no. Jesus fills all and is in all. There ain't room for... A, an unclean spirit in you. Now you might have one hanging around, whispering and poking and influencing and pushing the salt shaker around on the table, as it were. But it's not inside of you. And the last thing I want to leave you with is this. How does Jesus deal with the unclean spirit? Oh, I don't want to get near that person. That, that person has an unclean spirit, and I don't want that unclean spirit to get on me. How does Jesus deal with it? With authority. With authority. And who has he given that authority to? You and me. You run across something like that, you just take authority over it. You take authority over it. Ken Blue tells a story about a, he, he, he sets it up this way, he says, I was, I was on Interstate 5 in Los Angeles, and he said, I, I saw something that absolutely astounded me, is uh, eight lanes of traffic, or however many it was, it's, it's cars going 70 miles an hour, and you know, oh, eight lanes in one direction, maybe eight lanes over there in the other. And this man walked out in the middle of the road and held up his hand and stopped traffic. Stopped all of it. It was a California Highway Patrolman. He held up his hand and he said, stop. And everything had to come to a stop. Why? Because he stood under authority. He stood under the authority of the state of California. 
spelled now with a K. And the reason everybody stopped is because they knew if they didn't, there'd be consequences. You stand under the authority of Jesus Christ, and when you hold your hand up and say stop, it has to stop. We have kingdom authority and kingdom power because Jesus has kingdom authority and kingdom power, and he has shared it with you and with me. All authority in heaven and earth has been handed over to Jesus. And he shares that kingdom authority with you and I. Our, our memory verse, um, we'll go ahead and put that up now. Our memory verse um, for today is uh, Luke 12, 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If Jesus tells us that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, do we have kingdom power? Do we have kingdom authority? Yeah, absolutely we do. If it's ours, we have authority. There's a there's a case going on, I forget which state it was, uh, where, where this little town, they were dissatisfied with their sheriff, and so they called a town meeting, and the lady who called the meeting, whose meeting it was, was arrested by the sheriff's department for disrupting the meeting because there's some law on the books about saying bad things about people in public meetings and it's deemed a disturbance or an offense or whatever. So she was arrested at her own meeting by the guy that she was talking bad about. And so now it's going through the courts. And it's going, no, 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 that's her meeting. She has authority there. You have been given the kingdom. You haven't been given a piece of the kingdom. You've been given the kingdom. Jesus walks in and he's teaching in the synagogue, blowing people's minds because they've never heard anything like it. They've been there week in and week out their whole lives hearing the law, the prophets, and the writings, and they've never heard anything like this, like what Jesus is saying. And then he demonstrates his authority, kingdom authority. Now, if he'd, have, if he'd have thrown somebody out of the room because they were intoxicated or, or um, you know, being disruptive in some way, well, okay, you know, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's kingdom authority, maybe it isn't, right? You and, you know, just any Joe Blow off the street could do that, but here's a man with an unclean spirit, and Jesus just says, knock it off, get out of there. Leave that man alone. And the unclean spirit recognizes who it is. The Holy One of God. That's kingdom authority. And guess what? It was the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus says, fear not, little flock. Do you hear the affection in that? Do you hear comfort and assurance? For it was the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So if the kingdom has been given to you, and I, maybe, maybe we should take possession of it, lay hold of it, believe that that's true, and then go about your life in exercising your kingdom authority. We're going to um, begin passing the elements. Thank you, Pastor Ivan. Pastor Skip.
our experience when we take the communion elements together is not one of attempting to reach a distant deity or as the ancients would say, Deus Absconditus, but we are joining in communion together as those who live in the presence of Jesus Christ who lives in us. To celebrate our union, I mean, that's what the word communion means. It, mean, it comes from two words, common union. In the New Testament, the koine or common Greek word is koinonia, fellowship. We fellowship together in the body and the blood of Jesus. Celebrating today um, in this sacrament the salvation of the human race, the undoing of the fall, the end of sin, and sin consciousness. We're going to begin uh, maybe a three week series here before long on sin consciousness and whether or not we should be sin conscious or not. I hope you will be astounded. By that thing. So, if you would join me in prayer. Father, we ask for astonishment in the consumption of this bread, the body of Jesus. this wine his blood and we thank you that we have it in Jesus name Amen well if you'd like to um, support what we're doing here if you'd like to share in in that um, you can text a gift to 804 409-0445 you can visit our website, gchanover.org. Is it dot com? Dot org. I think it's dot org. I'm trying, but it's dot org. It's on the sign back there. Sorry. Um, and there's also um, paper envelopes in the back if that's how you would prefer to do it. But it's quick and easy. Just a quick text, and we're done. So uh, God bless you, and we'll see you again next Sunday.